All right, hi Year 11s, this is Mr. Lim here, and this is our very first video for Year 11 about the history of atomic structure. So let's get started. Okay, so uh, we're gonna be, uh, every time you watch one of these videos, you're gonna have the learning intentions there and the success criteria. So you're just knowing what you should be able to do, you should probably skip back to this um, part of the video at the end of it, just to make sure that you can remember that you can, uh, what you're supposed to do and be able to actually traverse things. All right, so. Today we're going to be learning about the history of the atom, which means that we're going to be learning about all the experiments and ideas that were um, contribute to how we understand the atom as it is today. All right. So this uh, first scientist called Dalton. All right. Uh, he was wasn't the first person to think about atoms as uh, that make up everything. All right. Atoms being something that is uh, indivisible, which means that you can't divide it anymore. All right. Uh, he wasn't the first one to work it out, but he was the one to start thinking about it and start giving explanations about it. All right, so he thought that all atoms of an element had the same mass and the same properties. All right, and then when you were to combine certain atoms of an element in a fixed ratio, they gave you a different uh, substance, a compound he called them. And these compounds, they um, have different properties to their individual elements. All right, and it's due to the fact that you've got them together as a rearrangement of those atoms of those elements that gives them the different properties. Okay, so it's the idea that um, compounds, actually I guess all matter is made up of atoms, that's important, all atoms have of the same element have the same mass and the same properties, okay? Compounds are combinations of atoms, right? Two or more different elements in fixed ratio, that's important. That means that you've got like, uh, if you've got one of one type of atom, then you've got two of the other type and you've got that all the way through the um, the substance. All right, chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms. So the idea is that you're rearranging how they're attached to each other. And it's based on the law of conservation of mass and the law of constant composition. Okay, so law of conservation of mass, hopefully you remember from year, I don't know, nine or 10 or something like that. The idea that when you have a chemical reaction, the mass of all the products and the mass of all the reactants have to be equal. So no matter is lost in the chemical reaction, all right? And law of constant composition is the idea that compounds will have uh, the, the same composition throughout their, uh, their substance, which means that that idea of one atom of one type and uh, two atoms of the other type all the way through the um, substance. All right, so the idea is that when a chemical reaction occurs between two elements, they change their arrangement, which changes their properties, okay? But when you do another chemical reaction to bring them back to their original elemental state, which means that they're back in their elements, you change the arrangement again, and then the properties of the atoms do not change, they go back to what they were before, right? The arrangement is the is the thing that gives them the different properties from each other, okay? So the idea is that here we have two different elements, the red ones and the green, uh, red ones and the blue ones. When you change them and in a chemical reaction to a different arrangement, they have different properties. But if you were to bring them back to their original states, they would go back to having their original properties because the atoms have the same properties uh, it's when they've got the same arrangement, all right? It's the arrangement that gives them their properties unless you keep them in um, their pure form, all right? So that's the idea of Dalton. Law of conservation of mass and law of constant composition were his things, and the idea that uh, defined atoms of an element and defined compounds, all right? Next was a dude called Thompson, all right? He built a cathode ray tube, all right? What's a cathode ray tube? We'll get that. So a cathode ray tube is a tube of glass, right, which was emptied of air, and then a large charge is placed on two metal plates inside that tube of uh, glass. All right, here's a little bit of it here. All right, I haven't drawn the glass around it, but yeah, there'd be a big glass tube in there. All right, and so you've got your very strongly ch negatively charged plate and very strongly charged positively charged plate. All right, so two charges placed in the metal plates inside the tube. This causes negatively charged particles 
to come out of the cathode, which is one of the metal plates, and towards the anodes, which is the other plate. And then these particles are allowed to pass through a small slit and create a beam. Okay, so let's have a look here, right? Here we have the two charged plates in black, right? And the anode is the positively charged one, so that's this one here, okay? That's the anode in black. So that anode in black is positively charged and negative particles seem to come out of the negative plate and towards the positive plate because, you know, negative things are attracted to positive things. And if you leave a slit in the middle, which is that thing there, right? Negatively charged particles can fly through it. And so you've got the stream of yellow and the stream of green negative particles, right? So these negative particles are then affected by other charged plates or magnetic fields. The negative char particles are affected by other charged plates or magnetic fields, right? And the negative particles were found to move towards the positive charges, uh, charge plate, meaning that they were negatively charged, right? So just in other words that they're oppositely charged. So that's why those stream of positive and negative particles, they're moving towards the positive plate here. Okay, that positive plate there, that's the negative plate there. The positive plate is attracting them, making them want to go that in that direction. And so they kind of curve along that line, All right? Now, what they found was that the negative particles found to be moved very easily by the charged plates of the magnetic field which means that they have a very small mass. Because if you think about it, the, the charged plates that are affecting their flight are like, um, is like the wind. And things that are very light are more affected by the wind than things that are very heavy. So the smaller, and so this very small mass was much smaller than the mass of any atoms that they had worked out already. Okay, Meaning that they had to be subatomic, which means smaller than uh, atoms, particles. Right. So if you look here, um, this one here uh, is lighter than this one here because it is more affected by the thing. And the idea is that they, um, they worked out that the very, very light, these things are very, very light, which makes them uh, much lighter than the atoms that they were uh, supposed to be inside. And so therefore they were small parts of that atom. Okay. Um, he ran the experiment with all kinds of, oops, they didn't want that. He ran the experiment with all kinds of elements. So he found that they did it over and over again, right? So they all acted the same and they all had very small mass, meaning that all elements had these very small negatively charged particles, okay? So after a while, they decided to call them electrons. And so these, and so they thought that these small negative particles were embedded in the center of the atom like choc chips in a choc chip ice cream or choc chip cookie, right? They called it a plum pudding model because, you know, plum puddings were apparently popular back then. But the idea is that they're embedded within the thing, right? So, and that would be what they look like. So here is the atom, okay? This entire thing is the atom, right? And within that atom is the little bits of uh, negative charge and everything else in that atom is all positively charged. Right, they didn't know what it was yet, but they, they, they knew it had to be positively charged to balance out to make it neutral. All right. Then next was this dude called Rutherford, all right, who did the gold foil experiment. So he made a super thin piece of gold foil and then shot alpha particles at them. Okay, so at the time, they thought that the size of the atom was much larger and thus didn't have a very high density. So like a beach ball, right? And so they thought with this low density, the alpha particles were going to go right through it or the idea that they would kind of push them out of the way because of their such low density. Okay, so if you think about it, there's the, there's the model that, um, what's his name made? Thompson. And then these are a whole bunch of them in a row. Okay. Now imagine these are like beach balls and you're shooting a bullet at them. If the beach balls didn't, um, you know, explode, the beach ball would just simply get pushed out the way because it's so low density. Because they thought, well, the size of the atom we can work out, the mass of the atom we can work out, but they seem to be then very low density. All right, so he's expecting it to go right through it 
and you, he's expecting a lot of them to go right through it, right? However, this is what happened. A lot of them did go through the substance, but every so often, one of them bounced back as if it hit something very hard and very high density, right? So the idea is that if it's hitting something that's high density, and he did it over and over again to make sure that it was right, if, something's hit, if it's hitting something high density, there must be something high density within those, these atoms, right? And so they came up with the idea that if things are still going through, there must be like empty space, which the, the particles can go right through, okay? But because there must be something that's very high density, maybe all of the mass of the atom is focused in one very, very, very small part in the center, right? Meaning that there's large gaps between them here and here. So the idea that they have a very small, very dense nucleus comes from that idea that, well, a whole bunch of stuff went through, but one, but every so often it hits something very dense, and that dense thing would be the nucleus. Okay. And then finally, after, uh, rather third was Bohr. Okay. Actually, no, not even finally. I still got two guys to go. All right. So, Bohr. He worked out the quantum mechanical model. So the idea is that if the center is very dense, then and separate from the negatively charged electrons, because you could cause the negative electrons to separate from the materials but not the positive charge, then what were these electrons doing? Okay, so they've worked out it's got a small base, small center part with very high density. The electrons are somewhere, they must be around somewhere. Um, so since these are negative and positive charged, they thought that they're gonna be attracting to each other and not being able to see what the electrons are doing. They assume that the electrons are in orbit because, you know, attracting things like the Earth and the Sun. Um, they orbit around the center, which is the nucleus, right? However, what they did was they also saw that if you give electrons energy, okay, so if you give them energy of some sort, they will emit light of a specific wavelength, okay? Um, and the light that being emitted uh, as the electrons move from one orbit to another meant that there were multiple orbit paths for these electrons, but not anything in between, okay? And they man meant that they created well-defined paths. So that's a bit, and we're gonna be going through this a little bit later on, but this is the idea, right? The idea is that when you gave these little blue electrons energy, right, they would move up and then they would come down. When they came down, they released light. And these lights were exactly uh, specific uh, amounts of energy. And because of these specific amounts of energy or portions of energy, they must be in distinct layers. Because if you think about it, right, if they went to here, if they went to here in this kind of empty space and then came back down, you would have you wouldn't have exactly one hundred units of energy every single time. You would have like you know, and then like you know, some of them went up to here, and some of them went down to here. Some of them only went up a little bit. Some of them only went down a little bit. If they could go everywhere, then you wouldn't have these specific portions of energy. But because you have these specific portions of energy, they only go up to certain levels, right? It's like saying, "Oh, I'm going to the first floor, or to the second floor, or the third floor." But there's no such thing as going to the two point six floor. All right, because uh, you're just gonna be floating in the middle of the air and that just doesn't work. So the idea is that they would have certain levels and only they could they could only exist in those levels, and it's because of the light that they gave off was in specific amounts. All right. And we'll be learning about that later on as well. And then finally, this guy Chadwick, which I'm sorry, Chadwick, but I gave you the wrong. I didn't change your name, sorry. All right, Chadwick. So there was still confusion about the center of the atom because the number of protons did not match the mass of the atom. Okay, the idea is that if you've got positive stuff in the middle, uh, what's holding all those positives together, and um, the masses just didn't match. So what they did, they ended up shooting some alpha particles at beryllium, as you do. I'm sure they just shot alpha particles at everything to see what happens. And they found out that the emit, and but they found out is that the beryllium particles emitted particles, which were highly penetrating, but were not affected by magnetic or electric fields. And if they're not, affected by magnetic or electric fields, it means that they were neutral, right? So the idea is this, um, shoot some alpha particles at some beryllium and something came out, 
right? These little green things came out. These little green things that came out were not affected by the magnetic field or electric fields, right? Uh, so remember how electrons are affected by electric fields. Positive charges would also be affected by electric fields, but these things were not affected by electric fields, which means that they must be neutral or at least not positive or negatively charged. However, those things that they shot at them, when they hit a paraffin film, which is like, you know, some of something else, they knocked off protons off those uh, atoms, and those protons were affected by a magnetic field, okay? Because these things are being knocked off by something, and these protons are affected by a magnetic field, they're being drawn towards the negative charge plate, right? And so therefore, these things that came out must be within these beryllium things, right? Of this beryllium atoms, and what they worked out was that if they're coming out of this stuff and, you know, uh, they must have done it for other elements as well. Uh, they knocked off protons. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, change. Okay. They knock, so when you shoot it at the paraffin film, it knocks off protons, um, which can then be detected because they move um, around in the electric fields. That suggested that there is a neutral particle within the pro within the neutron, about the same sorry not within the nucleus, about the same mass that was uh, of the proton. All right. So that's the history of the atom. Sorry if that took so long. There, you know, there might be one or two multiple choice questions of this in the exam. It's not a very large part. So if you're just watching this and you got it all the way to the end don't really have to memorize all of it, but it's a good idea to just kind of have an understanding of why there is, and we're going to be going through some of this stuff later on as well. All right, that's all. Adios.